hadn't done anything with them for three years. And then they destroyed our garden this year. So I declared war on them. <laughs> and so far, 12 are gone. I looked on the Internet. You fill a five-gallon pail about halfway full of water. You pour some unbroken sunflower seeds. And it looks like it's ground. They go in there and they drown. Now, that might not be a nice thing to talk about at the Grace Conference, but it's, it's reality. So um, <laughs> the 12 chipmunks, uh, two mice, and one bird flew in there. I can't swim and swim. So, um, but it, it worked. It worked. Um, are you enjoying the conference? Good. Yeah. I'm real, real glad to be here. You know, I recognize just about everybody's faces, but what's going on with me these days, I can't remember your name. I don't know if that's the start of something or the end of something. I'm not sure about that. But the topic, uh, the theme of the conference is the great mystery. My topic is assurance. And to study how the full assurance provided by an understanding of grace is essential for a stable and productive Christian life, full conviction, full persuasion, utmost certainty of salvation. This is true freedom. This is true liberty. This is true peace. Romans 4.21 says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of fellowship in your word, and thank you for this beautiful day. And um, also, I want to thank you for all the folks out here that, that came to, to the conference, and to pray for all of them to keep strong in the faith and not to be tossed to and fro with what the world is throwing at us these days. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. So if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this is our first, first topic. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, first passage. <coughs> chapter 1, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. Get to the right page here. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. This word, assurance, it's a Latin word, and the ending of this word, A-N-C-E, let me read you here, it's a suffix added to the stem of a verb to form a noun indicating quality, state, or condition. Now, you can take condition and make that standing. Our state is we're down here in our earthly bodies. Our standing, our condition is we're in the heavenly places. We're saved, and we can't lose our salvation. The assurance is the act of furnishing any ground of full confidence. Words like, well, let me read you. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Folks, due time began in Acts chapter 9. The church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace began in Acts chapter 9. Not in 11, not in 13, not after Acts 28, in Acts chapter 9. Don't deviate from that, and it'll, it'll keep you well. So let me read you, uh, go to Acts 17, uh, quick, real quick here, Acts 17. Let me read you a couple verses there. Acts 17, I'm going to read you verses 30 and 31. Paul says, in the time that this ignorance, see that suffix at the end, A-N-C-E? Before you were saved, did you have a condition or a, from God? Were you, were you going to go to heaven when you die? Or were you going to go to hell? So, but God, in times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto some men, all men, and that he had raised him from the dead. 1 Corinthians 7, 23 says, You are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. It does not say you're being bought. You're bought. It's past tense. It's a done deal. I know everybody here understands that. Now, if you go to Colossians chapter 2, our second passage, Colossians chapter 2, let me read you two verses in there. Colossians chapter 2, 
verses 2 and 3. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That, tri that trinity of word, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. You should look in your Bible to see how many verses that's in. I think the first one you find it in is Exodus 31, verse 3. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The, there's three mysteries here that's, that's talking about. You notice that it says all the treasures. A treasure is a place to which things are, precious things are collected and laid up. How many of you have precious things? And what do you do with your precious things? Do you store them somewhere? Right? To, to keep, you know, possibly to use and, you know, in the future if needed. Um, Deuteronomy 11, 18, it says, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul. God says he's magnified his word above all his name. He says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Um, if he's magnified his word above all his name, what does that tell us? What's the most important thing? His word. You know how we tend to categorize things as most important, less and less than that? The top issue is the final authority issue. And under that comes right division, 2 Timothy 2.15, because most of your newer Bibles don't have that in the right way. So, what is the mystery of God? If you want to write this down, I'm going to be going pretty quick. It's Romans 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery of God is the summation of God's prophetic program. Those things which were made known since the beginning of the world. That's the mystery of God. The mystery of the Father is in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath pur purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the mystery of the Father is the summation of both programs, the mystery program, the prophetic program, and the mystery program. When God's going to reconcile things and change it, you know, the fire's going to take care of it, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The last one here is the mystery of Christ, and that's Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 5. Ephesians 3, 4, whereby when ye read, ye might understand my, myst my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The issue is the church, the body of Christ. And you can't read about this anywhere. Let me say this. You can't research this anywhere in the Old Testament or in the Gospels. If you come up to people, if you're talking to people, as you know Debbie and I do all the time, and they say that, well, they give you a John 3.16 as the verse that saves today. Um, what should you do? Well, God, you know, he died. He, well, let me go there. I'm drawing a blank here. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. There you go. Thank you. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that verse a salvation verse for today? But a lot of people use it, don't they? So how do you get them to, to understand that that's not the right verse to use? Well, you can make a bet with them. First, they have to understand, ask them if they understand salvation. If you believe Christ died for your sins and he was, you know, crucified, shed his blood and was buried and rose again. Yes, I do. Okay, is that good news? They say, yes, it is. You can bet anybody $1,000 if they can find that message anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I know I've said this before, but it's effective. Because you're putting a big dent in the brain. What's this guy talking about? You know, is he being rude? I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to give them some information. The context in John chapter 3 is Israel under the law and Nicodemus, the Pharisee. 
It's not the dispensation of the grace of God. It's not the gospel of the grace of God. It's not salvation as a free gift. It's none of those things. Okay, Christ died for the world, but anyway, where does the good news come about the cross? Does it come in Acts chapter 2, where most Christians think that the church began? When he told them that Christ, that they just killed the, their Messiah, he pricked their hearts. Did they jump up for joy? No. They, they were upset. The good news about the shed blood of the cross, as we all know, starts in Romans chapter 3. So the good news of the shed blood. Proverbs 10, 14 says, Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of foolish is near destruction. What I want to do for the rest of the time, I want to talk about things that have given me assurance. I want to personalize it. When Debbie and I first got saved, we were at Jim Kirkwood's church, and um, Paul Stathis, he's not here today, he patiently explained the difference between law and grace in the lobby, and we understood that. We were both raised Catholic. When I realized the word hope, in English, it means wishful thinking. I hope it's a good day today, right? But the word hope in the Bible, again, this is one of the first things that really got my heart. It's different from our hope. It means a confident expectation of a future certainty. It's assurance. Did you know the word deliverance in the Bible is the same word as redemption? The A-N-C-E at the, at the end of that. Paul says in Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life with God that can ally, promised before the world began. It's a promise from God. Does anybody know, can anybody say to me off the top of your head, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It's only a two-word verse. Rejoice evermore. Thank you very much. You know what that word rejoice means? To celebrate. To show that an occasion or event is special. What good is your verse, is your Bible, if you don't have an assurance of heaven? What good is it if you have to wonder all the time whether I'm going to heaven or not? People who want to beat their truth into you they're very insecure people. You have to believe everything I say exactly the way I say it. That's not confidence. That's not hope. That's legalism, and that's wrong. There's a, in any passage that speaks of losing your salvation, and there's a lot of them, it's always addressed to the nation of Israel, always, never in Paul's epistles. Recently, my wife and I went out to um, breakfast with, a, with an old girlfriend of mine, believe it or not. Um, she contacted me about two years ago on the Internet. First question was, is this the same Ray Keeble I knew back when, you know, when I was 21? You know? Yeah, it's the same one. Are you married? <laughs> I go, yeah, happily so. So, Debbie was standing right there. Uh, <laughs> smart move. Keep it up, you won't be. <laughs> She's in the back of the room now. I'm preaching to you, my dear. Anyway, she, uh, I gave her all the stuff about salvation, kind of overdid it on Facebook. And then she said, would you like to go to breakfast sometime? I go, sure. So the night before I'm going to meet her, she slips me something on Facebook. You have to bring your wife. I said, no problem. <laughs> so we went there. I brought that breakfast. I figured if I'm buying, I'm going to give her some information. We did. She sat there silently. We gave her tracks, and then we left. Now, two years later, would you like to meet for breakfast again? You can meet my sister and my mother. Her mother's 89 years old. I said, can I bring my wife? She goes, yeah. <laughs> so we had a, well, a good time. Her sister, th these are Italian-Irish Catholics, hardcore. It's like Irish Catholic, hardcore. And it, you really, they have such a thick wall. I met her lovely 89-year-old mother. There's not many of those people around. 
and her sister was there. Her sister, I said, you know what I remember about you? Now, believe it, I only went out with her a couple of months, and I was head over heels, but she dumped me, and understandably so, <laughs> given that, you know, part of life I was in, you know. I wasn't that long out of Vietnam. I was drinking things up. You know, I wasn't a real nice person, you know, I, from what I've been told, what I remember. But the point is, she, she said, my sister, Francine's going to be there. And I said, you know, Fran, the last time I saw you, I was in your living room waiting for Lori to get dressed. And this guy named Richie came in. He was, you were going to go out on a date with him. And he's smiling. He's got this frizzled afro hair. You know, it's 1971. And, you know, he's smiling. I said, is he stoned? She goes, yeah, he was really buzzed. So I guess this guy led her into abusing drugs for seven years. And she did that, but she said, then I got saved. And her mother and her, Lori, the, my ex-girlfriend, they're sitting there just kind of, and she went on and on about a lot of emotional stuff and all that, you know, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really say anything. Then this ex-girlfriend of mine, she said, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And I wanted to say to her, um, no, he doesn't. <laughs> if that's not a verse in the Bible, he works in predictable ways, and all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God but I couldn't because the opportunity wasn't right. Anyway, that's, I have a pretty nice wife that's willing to do that, right? She wants to see people get saved. So, Paul says in um, 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He didn't tell us to Mary. He didn't tell us to Moses. He didn't tell us to Peter. He didn't tell us to a Pope. He told us to Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. 1 John 3.20, here's a great verse. Interdispensational, if you think of it this way. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. How many people have wondered or, or that you've talked to, you know, I can lose my salvation, right? I did something and I can't, God can never forgive something like this, but he does. He doesn't grade on a curve, as I say all the time, all have sinned. He throws in murderers and liars, Revelation 21.8, all have sinned. And that's a big piece of knowledge to have in your mind, especially if you were raised Catholic, because you're filled with guilt and fear for your exposure to that <coughs> message. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. It's the faith of Christ, not our faith. The moment you realize that, underline those words of in Galatians 2.16. It's a great verse to use if somebody has any other different Bible. It takes out the word of and just puts the faith in Christ. But two times it used of Christ. If it wasn't for the faith of Christ, we wouldn't be here at this conference and we wouldn't be going to heaven with an assurance from a God that cannot lie. Amen to that, right? Amen. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do we own it? If you went out and paid cash for a car, would you own it? Do we possess our salvation? Yeah, I think so. Um, look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to go to this passage. Ephesians chapter 1. Starting at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of, your self, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This is the only time this phrase is used in the Bible. Purchased possession. You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. There will always be those who perpetrate false doctrine. We have somebody out west that's just ripping apart Romans 8, 17 and has moved from that to saying now the judgment seat of Christ will have to deal with some of our sins. Is that true? You know, the religion I grew up in, there's a name for that. It's called purgatory. It said you're not complete in Christ. He didn't die for everybody. You have to do some of the work and then you really can't know if you're going to go there anyway. Is that assurance? Is that deliverance? Is that a disturbance? Yes, it is. There's an Ella fella that I just got called an old dog by this guy, which, which is fine. 
And he came into Gray School of the Bible. He called one day and he said, are you guys hyper-dispensationalists? And I said, well, but, you know, we've been getting the phones almost 20 years now. I said, why don't you tell me what you think I believe and let me respond to that? Saves a whole lot of time. <laughs> so he did, and I did, and he started the school. Now, this guy was deep. He was in his late 30s, and he was, you know, had forgotten. He was raised a, uh, Baptist, I think. And he was deep in his questions and all that. And a couple of the questions I, I said to him, I'll have to get back to you on that. You know, you know, I didn't know the answers. But, and he was going through grade school, the Bible, and then he started getting, um, he started changing. And he started, he told me one day, he said, he doesn't believe in the King James, you know, situation. And I talked to him as best I could. And I said, okay, you know, I didn't stop talking with him. And he ended up becoming a Greek guy. And when you become a Greek person, I mean, if you want, if you want to go to the Greek and try to prove things in the Greek, it's, I am so thankful being saved at 41 years old, that I didn't have to study Hebrew and Greek. I could go right to a Bible in my language and feel secure in that. Amen. I'm very, very thankful for that. So when you want to pull a Greek on me, you're not going to have a happy camper. <laughs> and I had told this guy my position many times. I'm there. I'm solid on that. So he writes me a letter. He, he, he talked to me one day on the phone, and my grandson was there. You know, I wanted time with him. He's going on this Greek stuff. I said, listen. I've talked to you about this. You know where I'm at. You know, I don't believe in that, you know. And he, and he says, fine, I'll go. So he, he sends me an email. He says, um, I'm sorry for irritating you, but old, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> now, I don't mind being called an old dog because I am. <laughs> but the Bible isn't tricks. It's truth. Amen. And I had told this guy repeatedly that, you know, here's where I stand. And he insinuates that I'm not studying. He says, I've come across a bunch of young people that believe the, the rapture now is post-trib. That's the other movie made. I go, well, I also know a lot of young people that don't believe that way, that believe in pre-trib. And can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, any time I talk to somebody that wants to be use the Greek, here's their MO. They, there's a bunch of pride there, and they want to be the final authority. No, it's me, not the verse. Listen to me. I'm the person don't believe, believe me, nobody else. That, it's always that pride all the time. And it's amazing um, what happens. Our heaviest burden that we, that we, which we have to overcome is self. And what goes along with that is pride. God's peace and God's rest are different from the world's peace and the world's rest. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the peace that we get from God is not something on the outside, it's inside. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. End of the passage, unto your souls. Romans 5, 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Yesterday, I had a call in between killing chipmunks. And, the, or pulling, and it's a woman that wanted prayer. And when people ask for prayer, you, you always want to ask what's going on. Then you try to bring them to passages to you know, help them out. I said, what's the problem? Well, my husband's cheating on me. And we stopped cheating on, on me with this other woman, but he meets this other one once a month. And he says, he's just talking to her. What should I do? I says, well, what do you want to do? Well, I love him. I says, that's good. I says, is he, listen to, is, is he giving you the love that you need, the security that you need? No. So what are you going to do? Well, I love him. I said, well, why don't you just go through Paul's epistles and start reading. Sooner or later, verses will start popping out at you. Write those down. And then, you know, maybe you can talk. He was 50-something, your husband, into not doing what he's doing. You know, um, I give you credit for wanting to stay with him. But, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to end until he ends it. You know, so I thought of a, a situation that 
this, what this guy called me uh, an old dog. There's a situation, if you remember, 1 Kings chapter 12, when the split came between the north and south of Israel. Read about Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and then Jeroboam, who was also a son of Solomon, but only from, from his a servant, a Nebat. And Rehoboam, he, he goes to the old guys, and they're, they're giving their advice to what to do with the, the people, of, you know, his people. And the younger guy says, no, you don't want to do that. Don't listen to the old guy. So the, the older guy said, you know, if you become a servant to your people, they will follow you forever. And so he listened to the young guys, and he said, give me three days. And he ended up coming to his people. He says, my father whipped you with whips, but I'm going to whip you with scorpions. I'm going to lay a heavier yoke on you. And what happened? That's when the split came. There's, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 6, there's a great little verse there. And these verses teach me something. Jeremiah 6.16. By the way, I didn't have a clock. Do you know what, how long I've been going? Well, I got a lot of information. Um, somebody give me a countdown from 10 minutes if they would. Oh, it's right in front of me. Okay. I've only got 20 minutes left? Okay. I'm going to have to do some adjusting. Uh, Jeremiah 6.16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old path, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. I'm an old dog. I'm an old path. And sooner or later, this guy's going to realize that. And, you know, you just never know what's going what's to happen here. Now, I want to do a little play of, with words here. We are to walk by faith, not by sight. Correct? I want to teach you how you can walk by sight and still be faithful to God in the dispensation of the grace of God. 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, All those in Asia have turned away from me. All those. Do we see people turning away from the truth today? Do you experience that? So we see this, right? So we can still walk by sight that way. We see this. What happens when we see that? It's just fulfilling God's words that he wrote thousands of years ago. That's all. History is replete with this truth. It's happening today. Why is the Bible contrary to mankind? Because it promotes God. It's against man, and the only pure and unadulterated history of mankind is the Bible because it shows us up for what we are sinners that need a Savior. Religious people get caught up in emotional bondage. Even Christians, they conjure up visions. Last year, I had two death threats, um, one in my assembly in South Bend. In fact, he, he, he threatened the, the whole assembly. This guy came in two times. I thought I preached him out the second time because he said, you know, I can spiritually cleanse houses and I can cast demons out of people. I said, we don't believe in that. So I preached kind of hard. He left. I thought he'd, he'd be gone. Well, he was waiting for me when I got there. South Bend's a two-hour drive. You know, and I think, what are you doing here? And I tried talking to him a little bit. I brought him up to the wall chart. He wouldn't have anything that. He said, if you don't believe me, I'm going to pray an avenging angel to come down and destroy your whole assembly. And I said to him, wasn't very graceful. He said, I'm going to leave. I said, well, don't let the door hit you on the way out. You know? I'm trying to find a verse for that, but, I, I, but you know, I haven't found it. So what happened? We had a new vehicle, and I ended up with three flats. I wonder if that was the avenging angel. No. Did you ever notice that animals don't have hum humor? It's only humans that have humor. God has humor. Let me give you some examples. If you recall in Job, he talks about the behemoth, about Satan. He's got a tail like a cedar log. He can drink up a river. He's got scales that can't be penetrated. He's a strong behemoth, they call him. And... He is chief of the ways of God, and he that made him can make his sword to approach unto him, Job 14, 19. The word approach means to draw near, to get closer, hand-to-hand -hand combat. What is the thing? What is, this, what is the thing that can take him out of your life? The sword of the Spirit, right? 
What is that? The Word of God. So a piece of paper with some ink on it can take out the devil. You think there's a little humor in that? <laughs> Acts 7, he talks about God's humor like 1,600 years before Paul was saved. When Moses, when Pharaoh's daughter took up Moses, she nourished him for her own. He was bred and fed and nurtured and taught all the wisdom of Egypt. And he turned out to be the one who took out Egypt, didn't he? Let my people go because we want to have a feast in the wilderness. Now, I want you to go to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter, chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 1. Jonah was a type of Christ. He was a type of the nation of Israel. He was a type of a disobedient, erring prophet. Let me read you just verses 12. And he said unto them, take me up. And Well, Jonah, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and talk to those people. And they were his sworn enemies. And Jonah tried to run away from God. He stood up in a, in a ship. Here's what happened. And he said unto them, this big storm came, came upon the ship. Take me up and cast me forth into the seas, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Jonah said, God's bringing this on you because of me. I didn't do what he, what he told me to do. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was, very temp and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord. Now, this is Jonah's Lord now. And said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from a raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Now, when God instructed Jonah to preach to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, he went, he didn't go there, he he. he Went the other way. On board the ship, the mariner, mariners figured out that the mighty tempest was put upon them by Jonah's God. They tried to row to safety, but their works could not save them. Only the death of Jonah, who was a type of Christ. So in the dispensation of grace, we cannot get saved by our own works, only by the death of Jesus Christ. They finally cast him into the sea so the storm would stop, and it did. Romans eleven fifteen says, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? They had come to know the Lord not through the faithfulness and testimony of Judah, of Israel, Jonah, I mean, but through his unfaithfulness and unbelief, he tried to run away from his responsibility. Romans 11.30, For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now have attained mercy through their unbelief. It's only with a completed canon of Scripture that we can go back and see certain types of mystery, right? Only understanding, rightly dividing the word of truth. We can go back and see these little things, these little licks God put in there to smack around the devil just a little bit. A little sadistic, a little sarcastic, you know, um, ironic humor, you know, satirical, whatever you want to call it. But he does it. What about Ezekiel 28? God's judgment on the prince and king of Tyrus for his sacrilegious pride. Prince and king, it's like the son of man. Well, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, verse 3 and 4. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. What is it that got us our salvation? It's a secret. So you see these little plans, these little, this little humor by God back in the Old Testament, and it it makes you realize that his ways and his he's are much higher than our ways and our thoughts. His ways and his thoughts are much higher than ours. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Another question. After being saved, did you lose any friends? Everybody has a few stories, right? Isn't it interesting that people you know for decades, if you meet up with them, you could talk about any subject except this topic, right? 
Doesn't the Bible, Joel's verses, teach that? All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He says living godly, it's not walking around looking holier than thou, robes and beads. It's just understanding the Bible and trying to abide by the truth. My best friend, when I was 16, he had a sister who was 10 years old. And she always liked me. And when she got older, it never happened because I always pictured her as my as 10-year-old on a bike, you know. And, and after I got saved, I got saved in 41, a couple years later I had talked to Tom, her, her, her brother, and he must have talked to, to his sister, and she called me up one night. She ringed me out. Now, they had went, gone to a Lutheran church. Their house ended right at the baseball diamond. Across the street there was St. Paul Lutheran Church. Back in the 60s, they preached the, the clear gospel. So she is reaming me out about, who are you to talk about the Bible? What, what kind of, who are you? She goes, I said, well, I just learned that salvation is a free gift. And I don't have to work for it. I don't have to have that fear and guilt. She goes, I've always known that. I said, how come you never told me? Click. <laughs> then another situation, I was in a, oil chain shop in my town live in. and I saw this girl I said I know that girl she dated my brother and I went up and talked to her she didn't recognize me at first which shows the outward man does prayers right and um, <laughs> then she realized oh no I, I I know I remember now so she started telling me about her life up to that point I didn't ask for it she just told me well, I got married, and, and I had a kid, and then I divorced that guy, and then I got married again, and he wasn't good, and, he, you know, and I divorced that guy, and my kid doesn't have anything to do with me because, you know, I don't know why, you know. And, and so she's telling all these, these bad things. She says, what's in with you? I said, I'm pastoring a church in South Bend. She goes, you? <laughs> she turned around and walked the other way without one word. And I have to tell you that this suffering comes with continued growth, which gradually turns to encouragement. Because you can read the verses in the Bible, literally fulfilled scripture. You can walk by sight and by faith. My brother got called from up from one of his friends back in, in high school. And the first thing he said to my brother, no, he's married the third time. I just had sex with a 29-year-old girl. How disgusting. <laughs> you know, and that's what Ron told him. Well, he, he's never called back. So it's, it's amazing what's going on out there. Another personal assurance for me is the, come January, Debbie and I will be married 39 years. And all the verses that talk about that, be faithful to your wife, be content with her breasts, and you know, her kind, you know, they have different and deeper meanings than they do now. And it's absolutely true. I read in Proverbs 12, 4, it says, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But it stops there. Does that mean a husband is a pain in the butt? <laughs> Proverbs 18, 22, whoso findeth the wife findeth the good thing and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. Does the husband get any credit? <laughs> so if the wife finds a husband, she doesn't have pain favor? So the word help me, God made to be help me, means literally to run to or to run to support, to help relieve from distress or difficulty, to assist and deliver from suffering. How many kids run to mom? Can there be any comfort, more better comfort than from a mom? You know, we just had our first grandson, and we have experienced A different love. Decker James. He's a loud noise at one end <laughs> and absolutely no responsibility at the other end. <laughs> and we love him. <laughs> How about aging in death? What does the Lord say about the elder man? And the parents, right? For those who insist on walking by sight, 
Aging gives many signs. You're always adjusting to a new normal. I don't need anybody to remind me about my old age. I have a bladder that does that for me, thank you very much. <laughs> That's as deep as I want to get. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be in the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. As you get older, three things happen. First thing that goes is your memory. The other two I can't remember. <laughs> I changed my password to incorrect. That way, when I log on, usually with the wrong password, my computer tells me what my password is. <laughs> At 65 years old, the phrase lucky means finding my car in the parking lot, <laughs> getting lucky. Things change. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Is there a positive side to aging? Well, you're closer to the Lord, but I found another one. Wrinkles don't hurt. <laughs> Paul talks about the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered. It's, well, and first, the test of spirituality today is to understand and recognize that Paul is the apostle for today. He's the prophet. And in ages to come, it's going to be the fact that you have to believe that Jesus Christ came the first time. Okay, that's two tests of spirituality in two time periods. You don't want to be a rabbi in that time period and wait for the Lord to come and ask him this question. Is this your first or second visit? because he's coming with wrath. <laughs> Another thing that gives me personal assurance is the grass always looks greener on the other side, but it never is. More people moved out of Illinois last year than were born in Illinois. And a lot of destinations, there's Texas and Tennessee. My brother's in, in, in Tennessee, or Texas. And I got people that have moved to Tennessee, and they called me up, and they said, oh, the Bible Bell is so great. People are so nice and all that. Well, really? I've been getting calls from the South for 20 years. And the people don't rightly divide. How many people down there rightly divide the word of truth versus up north? There's no difference. They get angry and mad at you just because you don't want to believe what they believe. And you're trying to give them the truth. God gives us, we, we have the victory already. He's given us the victory through Jesus Christ. So, but the reason why people have greener grass is they have sprinklers and they use fertilizer. Religion also sprinkles and uses fertilizer. Let me give you a verse. Malachi 2, 3, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your silent feast, and shall take you away with it. People think that what they want is better than what they have. Greener grass is better grass. Wanting something implies you don't have it. Most people value what they want more than what they have. The only way out of this mindset is to Keep wanting what you have, to not get bored with what you have, to still enjoy and be thrilled with what you have, the victory that we have in Christ. Amen. That's it. I've got two and a half minutes left. Let me go to this section. I called up two women recently whose husbands died. And I called them to ask permission if I could talk about their situation without mentioning their names. And both of them gave me permission. The first one is a woman, there's a couple in my church that her daughter was walking along, she's in her 20s, was walking along with her husband on the path, maybe some park somewhere. Husband, just shortly before his 29th birthday, just dropped dead right in front of her. Now, I said to her, I said, you know, I, I haven't experienced what you have experienced, but as a parent, you never want your child to be in anguish, in pain. And, yeah, I know that. And there's nothing you can do. The parents can do it. All they, all they had to, you know, well, I, let me take that back. 
There's something the parents did do. They had brought her up with the Bible. One of the reasons why she said, yeah, go ahead and talk about it because I know where he's at. It's only time and that now, time will help, you know, but and the knowledge of where he's at that helps. And then there's another woman that, she's a dairy farmer. If you've ever been on a dairy farm, I went up to Wisconsin for years, and one of the mornings, I, Debbie and I stayed overnight at their house, and, and we went out 4 o'clock in the morning and watched them milk the cows. If you've heard of, of 65 cows, you've got to milk them 365 days, twice a, twice a day. There's a lot of work there going on, you know, feeding them. And her husband died recently, and he, they all figured it would have been her because she's got the heart condition, but... He had a brain tumor, and he didn't have any pain at all. And she said to me something that's the best thing I've ever heard. She said, I had the opportunity to work shoulder to shoulder with my husband for 43 years. You talk about a Philippians 4, 8 moment. She could, she could have complained about a lot of things, but that, that came from her heart. I've got 12 seconds left, but I'm going to take just a little bit more time because I want to read you these verses, if I may. Isaiah chapter 57, verses 1 and 2. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come, he shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds. You're going to... People, the righteous people have died. They're going to enter into peace and they're going to rest in their beds. The righteous are delivered from the sting of death, not from the stroke of death. They are taken away in compassion so that they may not see the evil nor share in it nor be tempted by it. The righteous person, when he dies, enters into peace and rest. Job, in complaining about his birth, because of the sufferings he was enduring, describes the condition of a dead saint. He says in Job 3.17, There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the wearied be at rest. Psalms 37, verse 37 says, Mark the perfect man, that means complete, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Now these are all verses talking about our death. Ecclesiastes 7.1, listen to this one. A good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Wow. Meaning, death is to him who is saved better than the day of his birth. Paul says, for I'm in a strait betwixt two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. When Paul talks about our salvation, he just doesn't say it's a gift. He says it's a free gift. He says we own our salvation. When he talks about using plainness of speech, he just doesn't say plainness of speech. He says great plainness of speech. And when he talks about dying and being with Christ, he just doesn't say it's better. It's far better. So remember that and think about that. And I hope some of these verses will give you some assurance or confidence or rest. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the time and your word for allowing me this opportunity to preach to these people. Amen.